Hey y'all, welcome to The Blink Show. The next 30 minutes are jam-packed full of stories and celebrations from all over the country. We're chatting on Yammer, hashtag The Blink Show. I encourage you, log on and share your thoughts. So, let's get things started with a quick trip around the organization for our TFA buzz. Hello, Teach for America. This is Bretton Harris of the Regional Admin Team. And today, I have the amazing pleasure of introducing our new Admin Service Hub website. First, we've spent the past year listening to you and we're offering you a brand new website. Second, there's a brand new training hub. We've gone through every training and every resource that we offer to make sure that we've redesigned, rebranded, and updated all of our trainings to offer the strongest onboarding possible. Last but certainly not least, there's a brand new resource library. We've combed through all of the resources on our previous Google site, and we're proud to offer a much more organized, updated version of a resource library that's visually appealing and really easy to navigate. After spending a year crafting this resource and really thinking of every detail, we are extremely thrilled to be able to bring this to you today. Hey, I'm Rachel, and I work on the communications team here in New York. I'm here to talk to you about the TFA briefing. At this point, you've hopefully seen the briefing in your inbox, and you may be wondering, what's this all about? The TFA briefing is a bi-weekly roundup of the latest news stories and public conversations on Teach for America. Delivered straight to your inbox, the briefing also highlights important headlines in education news. The briefing is a resource for all staff members and alumni, and subscriptions are also open to core members, donors, and partners. If you know people who might be interested in receiving the briefing, please share it with them. Any questions or comments? Please email tfabriefing at teachforamerica.org. Thank you. Hi, this is Darren Glenn reporting for DO Support. As we find ourselves in the second placement season with the new placement tracker, I'm excited to share some updates with you. For this, I'm going to shoot it to our correspondent, Cassidy Rush, aka Crush, who's in the field with more details. Thanks, Darren. You know, this new system is more flexible. Regions can use categories to tag CMs and scores for more specific matching, can quickly create vacancies, and can add more specific license areas for CMs. Most excitingly, the placement tracker will house a hiring fair scheduling tool that will help you set up, run, and close out your hiring fairs. Back to you, DG. Thanks, Cassidy. It's clear to see that this system has something for every region. Be sure to check out the GDP Wiki for training and resources, and join the Placement Tracker Manager's listserv. See you in the tracker! Hi everybody, I'm ZB Davis from Memphis, Tennessee, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about our inaugural Early Childhood Retreat that we held on February 7th. We welcomed over 100 core members, alums, and community partners from the Mid-South area, including Memphis, Arkansas, and Mississippi. It was an incredible day of learning. We kicked off the day with some adorable student speakers talking about why they love their teacher and what they've learned this year in school. Did you know that pilgrims are real people? It was great to kick off the day with students and families. We learned together in sessions throughout the day. We learned about everything from public Montessori schools to oral language development to how to handle those tricky maladaptive behaviors in preschool classrooms. We even learned about CRT in early childhood and we kicked off our book study with the book Black Ants and Buddhists. At lunch, there was a share fair for teachers to share best practices from their classroom and steal from others. And we had a passionate panel of community partners all working with kids and families in Memphis so that we could be more unified in our work together. It was an incredible day of learning and we can't wait to do it again next year. Thank you to everyone who submitted to the TFA Buzz. In November, Tim M. West, who heads up our LGBTQ initiative, headed to Little Rock to hold the inaugural Deep South Summit. The first Teach for America conference of its kind, this summit gave TFA staff, core members, and community members focused professional development in creating safe classrooms where both LGBTQ students and educators can thrive. Watch. Hello, my name is Tim M. West and I'm Managing Director for Teach for America's LGBTQ Initiative. I think it's really important that we're doing work in the Deep South and, and really having a Deep South LGBTQ Education Summit in Little Rock. I started elementary school in Little Rock at Franklin Elementary School and 
uh, even at that time, uh, had an early awareness uh, that I was different. After so many struggles, not only in Little Rock, but Taylor, Arkansas, where I went to high school, um, a place where I survived a suicide attempt, and to come back to advanced, safer, and braver classrooms for LGBTQ youth. You know, it has that special meaning for me because I know that through working with our core members who are passionate about this work, uh, that we can eventually lead to uh, being in regions where we can have an impact on more of our classrooms being safe spaces. I am here as a black uh, lesbian from the South, and it is important for me to be a face for their students who might identify as LGBTQ, um, but in a positive light. What is important for me as a teacher is to know how to support my students who are LGBTQ. How do you support someone who has always felt ostracized uh, and not ready to come out and say, this is who I am, this is a part of my identity. And I want to be able to, one, understand, but also then be able to do that in a way that's meaningful and real. And I came to the realization that regardless of how strong the materials are that we present and how hard we work as educators if students don't feel safe in our classrooms and if they're not heard, they're not going to be learning. So I want to educate myself on how to train my current teachers so my current teachers are supporting all of our students and who they are. I kind of came here to feel empowered to get ideas on how to do this in a way in which I can coexist in a symbiosis with my community, which I don't want to come and insult it. And to be in a place that is a collective to start building power and start uh, building advocacy and to and, you know, make that voice heard, make it louder. Because I know coming into um, TFA, I certainly was hesitant. Coming from a region, a big city where everyone's okay, everyone's gay, it's fine. To now I'm like placed in the southernmost part of the country in Texas where yeah, I can get fired for being who I am if I choose to open up and identify as that. I want to be empowered in this space and focus on that positive stuff and then bring that into my students' lives. So I wanted to come here to see were there other core members like me? I'm really trying to learn from everyone's diverse experiences as an LGBT educator in the South and see what we have in common. Um, well, as a first year MTLD, I'm really curious to know how I can best support my teachers so that they're creating really inclusive, safe spaces in their classrooms. Caring about LGBTQ kids is a part of, a necessary part of educational equity. We have to really do this in um, tandem with all of our other efforts. Um, proud of TFA for putting this on. I think just affording an opportunity to start the dialogue. I'm just really excited that Teach for America is doing this. I belong to several teaching organizations and no one is talking about LGBT youth. Being here, being at this LGBT summit, it's, you know, it's a no-brainer. It is important for us to be here and to support the, the work of Teach for America and helping their educators so that they can help young people. It's obvious that the South is a place where injustice has been particularly uh, severe uh, across lines of race, class, um, and sexual orientation. Uh, that said, Arkansas has been a place where we've seen some real points of progress and hope recently. Um, and I think that this summit and this gathering here is another reason for that hope. Everything I learned about justice and social justice and doing the right thing, I learned right in this state. So like social justice and supporting and being supportive and loving to LGBTQ kids is not something I learned when I went to New York or when I went off to college or California. It's something that was cultivated right here. Uh, and I believe in a state, I believe in a region, I believe in a deep south that can really rise above some of the stereotypes and ideas that we can't be affirming and supportive of kids no matter how they, they present. And so, you know, with this summit, I've, I've said, you know, uh, that we want to um, learn with dignity, we want to teach with dignity, and we want to live with dignity, uh, and that's deep. Deep South Summit LGBTQ Education. The Deep South Summit is the first of its kind, and our LGBTQ initiative is hoping to extend its reach over the next year. Keep your eyes out for more opportunities to get involved with their efforts. This fall, you might have seen an announcement in the Monday Minute that TFA was getting its very own ombudsperson. And if you were like me, and I know many of you were, I thought that Teach for America made up that word. To our surprise, though, they didn't. And it's proven to be an important decision for our organization. 
Aaron French, host of the podcast Education on Tap and fellow internal communicator, sat down with Crystal Brocky, our ombudsperson, to discuss what she does, how she does it, and when you should reach out for assistance. Aaron and Crystal, welcome to The Blank Show. Thanks a lot, Kirk. Crystal, welcome to The Blank Show. Thank you. Okay, so for real, inquiring minds want to know, what exactly should we call you? Is it ombuds, ombuds, <laughs> ombuds person, ombudsman, ombudswoman, what is it? You know, I think I've gotten all of those things and probably more um, in the last couple of months since I took on this role and I've had to explain to friends and family and, you know, everybody at Teach for America what it is. And honestly, I'm okay with pretty much any of them. Um, it, it comes from having a similarly how to, hard to pronounce Scandinavian last name that I've just gotten used to over the years. Um, I, I personally use ombuds or ombuds person, um, but anything is fine with me. Great. So I want to talk a little bit more about your role in general. So uh, can you tell us why we decided to create the role of ombuds person um, in the present time? Yeah, so I, the the genesis, I think, you know, started as the operating model work was underway. Um, and in thinking about our commitment to our people, to team, and to the organization that we want to be for all of our staff members. Um, and I think in light of the fact that, um, you know, teams are evolving and changing and there are different roles that exist uh, that support our staff, we felt really strongly that there should be at least one consistent source of support for any staff member, regardless of what position you're in, regardless of what team you're on. And so I am now in this role where any person who is working at Teach for America um, is able to contact me, whether it's by phone or email at any time for virtually anything. And hopefully this will just be a sort of complement to the other supports that exist whether it's your manager or, you know, HA resources that your team might also have available to you. And I think that's totally, or that totally leads into my next question is why we even need your role, really. Yeah. Because I think a lot of people are wondering, like, then what's my HA generalist for or my strategy and ops team or my people partner if my team has one? How does your role differ from them? Yeah, definitely a good question. And, and I think one of the things that I've been trying to figure out how we can make clear for folks so they can understand. And, and I think the reality is probably very few staff members have all of those different resources that you just named available to them. So I think part of it is realizing, you know, for the team that you're on, what are the resources that exist? Um, I have an ombuds office page on the TFA hub, and there's a graphic that I've heard from a lot of people is helpful, which says, you know, here are the kinds of things that you might consider going to your team's HA generalist about, or here are the kinds of things that, you know, if you have a strategy talent and ops person or team, um, you know, what are the kinds of work that they do? Um, what is a little bit unique about my role is that I am very intentionally independent from the rest of the organization. Um, so a lot of times, you know, people sometimes need a place to go and to talk through an issue that they might be experiencing and, and want to be able to do that outside of their team structure um, or outside of a, a management line, if you will. Um, and so my role is really sort of present now to be able to give people that confidential space for them to talk through and think about what options might be available to them uh, for them to then choose to take action on in whatever way they, they choose to. So let's talk about this confidentiality piece. Yeah. How, how do you ensure that you are 100% confidential? I mean, you know, the, there's, there's a lot of ways that stuff can leak, to use, mm -hmm. to use a word. So how do you make sure that people's uh, information is secure or that what you're talking about doesn't go beyond you? Yeah, and confidentiality is one of the key principles of my role um, and is the same for any person that's in an ombuds or ombudsperson type role really in the United States and internationally. Um, and so there are some very consistent best practices that I have learned from the International Ombudsman Association that I'm now a proud member of. Um, so there are a couple of, of practices that I implement in my work every day. One is um, I no longer work out of a Teach for America office. Um, so I have a separate place so that 
you know, there would never be a risk of somebody overhearing a conversation that I would have that could potentially, you know, breach confidentiality or certainly make people uncomfortable if they knew that I was in a TFA office while we were having a conversation. Um, the second thing is I have set very clear standards around how I take notes. Um, and and actually how I do not keep formal records of any of the conversations that I have. So I have a trusty yellow legal pad by my side. Um, and while I'm talking with people, you know, I may jot down some informal notes. I actually never write the person's name down. Um, I use sort of a, a series of letters to help me keep track of information like that. Uh, but I think most importantly is um, I shred all of those papers within 30 days of any conversation. So, you know, when people contact me, one of the things I sometimes have to say is like, remind me of some of the details that we've talked about in the past, if this is maybe be a second or third or even fourth conversation um, because by design I'm actually not keeping records of those conversations that we're having. And so I think um, one of the things people will likely ask is sure you operate a little bit separately from the organization but you are still very much a part of yeah. Teach for America and the staff here so how, how does your role square with what you can share, say, to our senior leadership about the culture at Teach for America or maybe some trends that you're hearing from several different people? How do you report back to leadership at this point? Yeah. Um, I think it's important to know that I'm independent, but I'm not isolated. And so I think in order to actually be an effective resource and source of support for staff, I do need to be connected with what's happening in the rest of the organization. So I'm working really hard to make sure that I am, you know, keeping a pulse on what's happening at the organizational level. Um, and then in terms of, you know, really identifying trends, the, the one sort of formal data system that I use is a tracker that contains non-identifiable information that only lists, like, what are the core issues um, that people are experiencing? So nothing about a particular story, um, you know, it would be at the level of somebody came to me with a question about compensation or somebody came to me to talk about a challenging relationship that they might be experiencing so that I can actually look across that set of data to see what trends exist and use that to actually help you know, share, share some of that information with our senior leaders um, in a way that you know, I hope conveys the experiences of our people, but in a way that also protects their confidentiality um, and things that, that they're not ready or not comfortable to have shared in detail. We wouldn't be Teach for America without some data, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so my last question, and maybe one of the most important is, all this seems so secretive, so <laughs> I'm curious what your wardrobe choice is day to day. Are you in a, like a black trench coat and sunglasses? <laughs> on your way to the office so no one knows where you're going? So I live in the Twin Cities of Minnesota, so I'd say more often than not my wardrobe is dictated by weather. So yesterday I rolled in wearing like hardcore winter boots and jeans and a windbreaker. Um, but you know, Carmen San Diego was definitely a personal hero of mine as I was a kid, so I might consider uh, busting out a trench coat every now and then. <laughs> I would support that decision <laughs> anytime you, you decide to. Crystal, thanks for your time. Thank you. Back to you, Kirk. Thanks, Aaron and Crystal. Learn more about how you can utilize Crystal's expertise on the TFA Hub underneath the Staff Resources tab. Last month, over 900 staff members headed to Dallas for the TLD Summit. This three-day conference gave participants an opportunity to expand their skills, build their networks, and get some new inspiration. Now, you probably saw the highlights from the conference in the Monday Minute, but I want to share a great student speaker from one of the whole group plenaries. Jesse Mays is an eighth grade student at Thomas C. Marsh Preparatory Academy, and he absolutely blew us away. Watch. I'm here today to speak to you all. When my coach, Mr. Freeman, asked me if I wanted to do this, I instantly said yes. He told me I shouldn't say yes because I didn't even know what I was going to do yet. <laughs> He told me I was going to speak in front of a thousand people. I shrugged my shoulders and said, okay, I'll have to do it sometime. <laughs> if I didn't have debate, 
I wouldn't be here today telling you what inspires me to do what I want to do. I stand up here truly only because of the connections I have with the bait. It all started in a sixth grade mini debate held in Ms. Dale's classroom. Mr. Freeman had a small class that period that just so happened to be his debate class. We were discussing the practice of British personnel taking Australian Aborigines. We could side with the British or the Aborigines. I sided with the Aborigines. The team I worked with won in the end. As Ms. Dale was dismissing the class, the bell rang. I packed up my stuff quickly to head to my math class. When leaving, Mr. Freeman was at the door and he told me I should join the bait. We stood there for a good five minutes and he broke down everything, what debate was and how I could benefit from it. What he told me and how he said it got my mind hooked on being in debate the following year. All of summer had passed by and then came registration day. I volunteered to go with my mom, which was strange because I never really enjoyed going to get registered. <laughs> As we walked through the door, Mr. Freeman was in the front of the school. He saw me and went over to my mom and said, he needs to join debate. <clears throat> Please put him in my second period. My mom asked what it could do for me. And Mr. Freeman broke everything down for her, just like he did for me. She told him, yes, <clears throat> we're going to the counselors right now. I'll make sure to put him in your second period. So we headed down to the counselors with second period debate on my schedule, and that's how I joined debate. However, that's not why I'm here today. I'm here to tell you what inspires me. Debate makes me want to go to college. My top three choices are the Naval Academy, MIT, and Berkeley. I want to double major in aeronautical engineering and political science and minor, <laughs> and minor in professional communications. <laughs> you ask me what inspires me to do all of this. The answer is my teachers. My teachers are why. They have all helped me pave the walkway that led me into the doors of the real world. They are the main reasons I choose what I want to do in life. This school year, I joined a speech class with our other debate coach, Mrs. Hamlin. I truthfully, in the beginning, only joined so I could get a high school credit. <laughs> Mrs. Hamlin changed how I thought in writing. She made me enjoy writing. She taught me almost everything I know, not just about writing speeches, but writing in general. Both of these teachers were involved in what I wanted to do in adulthood. They both sacrificed time to not just me, but every student. That is how I think Teach for America teachers should be trained. I know you great men and women do this because they were both Teach for America teachers and are some of the best teachers I've ever had. They put in their time, money, and care into each and every one of us students. They treat us fairly when obedient, but know when to flip the switch and punish us. <laughs> not too lightly and not too heavily when disobedient. I have seen your work and I know what you can do. Here at Teach for America, you train super teachers and season them well. Now that you've heard what inspires me to do what I want to do in life, I hope one day I can hear what inspired you to do what you do. Thank you.
You can view more videos from the TLD Summit along with other Blink Show videos by browsing the TFA internal YouTube page. Two years ago, our Delaware region launched a pilot program that has garnered a ton of impact and recognition across the state. By trying to bridge the college access and information gaps for first-generation college students, they've unexpectedly created a potential pipeline of excellent teachers. Catherine Lindroff, Manager of Strategy and Community Partnerships in Delaware, brings us this story. So about three years ago, um, we actually held a focus group with our core members and alums about impact. It was a question about like to what extent did they feel like they were making an impact. And some of the concerns that came to the surface were just the fact that their high school students they were teaching every single day like didn't have any real support to actually get into college or even actually understand what it meant to apply to college. An alum, Ashley Sorensen, who is uh, now a fifth year teacher over at Howard High School, um, she and I really got into a discussion about what we could do about this. What I could do in my role on staff was link into all these existing community organizations who have been doing college access work over the last 40 years. And what she could do was engage her students and recruit them to the table. The First Gen Network is a near peer college access mentoring program. That means that we recruit, train, and place about 40 first generation college students and or students who share the background of our kids in Teach for America partner schools. She's this big community together of like this is what your future could be. Um, we go once a week for about two hours. We usually eat with them and then we do um, group sessions and then we also have individuals. Every week is a different learning objective. Um, it could be FAFSA we talk about one week or it could be the essay we talk about another week. I joined the First Gen Network because I saw it as an opportunity to help others. And I was once in their shoes, so I understand the scares and the, the situations they may be facing. I had a lot of people tell me no, a lot of people tell me this, that, and the other. I feel as though that they, if I could be the person that uh, changes their view on what they can do and what their options are, that they can really succeed and go farther than what they ever imagined. When I was in high school, I was just scared, not knowing um, where to start, not having AP classes, not having honors, and just pretty much going into it blindly and not having that drive or push for someone to um, motivate you to go ahead and apply to college. I joined First Gen mainly because, mainly so I can help somebody that, I can help somebody the way that I didn't get the help that I needed. For most of us, we were in high school maybe a year or two ago going through these same things, trying to get to college, trying to find scholarships, trying to fill out college applications. For us to be not that far ahead of them, we could really try to guide them through our mistakes that we made not too long ago. You see that kind of inkling in their eye, the curiosity that they're trying to, they're, they're um, obtaining from this program because they see what we're doing and they want to be in the position where we are. Our boys, of color are being mentored by boys of color that are doing so many positive things. So it's just like, we're, it's fantastic. So we originally started um, First Gen because we saw this as an enormous uh, benefit to high school kids. What we started to realize in this process, these people would make really good core members. <laughs> you, you know, they're, they're from this community. They share the background of our kids. They have authentic and personal stories that drive them, that, that make it, and they're empathetic towards these students in a way that I think is just, is, is, is deeply important to any educator. It gives them a drive to want to finish. Cause it's almost like I have the, I'm sitting here in front of these kids saying, you know, you need to be doing this. So I have to continue pushing myself to finish because I have people relying on me. Teach for America really helped influence a lot with my goals and what my plans are for after college. I would say it's definitely um, bettered my leadership skills and facilitation skills, just being in a role where I have to speak to students and really get to understand them. I'm thinking I'm gaining more of my sense of self. You know, everyone says they come to college to find out who you are. I'm finding out who I am. I'm finding out what I like to do and why I like to do it. I like to help people, and I like to make sure people know what they are worth. This feels like to be a massive movement of college students who want to support kids like them, who grew up just like them. It has the power to completely transform our value at a moment where TFA is becoming highly political on these campuses. I would say it's definitely changed my perspective. It kind of makes me want to be a teacher, but I just, I don't think I could do it. But 
Um, work. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm and I'm so proud of, of Rick and Ariel and Duray and Colleen as they are like starting their TFA applications after their second year. And I'm so hopeful as as they get in and, and highly prefer Delaware um, and and work here with us as a, as a team. Catherine is extremely dedicated to helping expand First Gen's impact to other regions, and she wants to provide an opportunity to answer any of your questions and help get the ball rolling. On March 11th at 1 p.m. Eastern, Catherine will host an information call for any regions or teams that want to learn more. Email Catherine Lindroth at teachforamerica.org to sign up and keep your eye out for a reminder in the Monday Minute. And that's our show. Thank you again to our TFA buzzers, to Mim and the participants of the Deep South Summit, Crystal, Aaron, Catherine, Jesse, the First Jenners, and of course, you. Until next time, bye.